Those who have heard me speak uh, usually, uh, if they've heard me speak three times, they've heard me at least quote once from Dr. John Gerstner, my mentor in seminary, who I regard as the most godly man I've ever met. And uh, however, though he was is godly as a person, as a professor, he was strictly diabolical in uh, his method of instruction, which he liked to call dialecture, which we called rigorous cross-examination and uh, interrogation as one would have in a prison camp. Well, he, Gerstner would put us on the spot frequently with difficult and thorny theological questions and try in a Socratic method to draw the answers out from us and have us withstand the debate that he would uh, uh, provoke in the classroom. And I'll never forget one occasion where he said, today, gentlemen, I am going to be a Mormon theologian and you are going to be Orthodox Christians and you're going to have to enter into discussion and dialogue with me about some of the basic concepts of the nature of God. And he said, now as a Mormon theologian, my first declaration is this, that God has a physical body. Because after all, the Bible says that we are created in the image and in the likeness of God. And the only way we could be created in the image and the likeness of God would be if God Himself in some way looked like us and therefore has a body. Not to mention the multitude of times in the Scriptures where the eyes of God are mentioned, the feet of God are mentioned, the arm of God, and so on. Said so it would seem to be clear from Scripture that God has a body. And he said, how would you respond to that? And then he looked at me <laughs> and he said, Mr. Sproul, what would you say? And I said, well, I would take that person immediately to the New Testament, to the teaching of Jesus, to the woman of Sychar, where he had this discussion with the woman of the well at, at a point in which he said to her, God is a spirit. And he who worships him must worship in spirit and in truth. And he said, well, he said, that's an interesting observation. He said, but just because the Bible says that God is a spirit does not outlaw the possibility that he also has a body. Because I go back to Genesis and it says that God created man out of the dust, shaped him into a body, and man became a living soul, a nephesh and that people are called spirits in the Bible because they have a spiritual aspect to their identity and to their person. And so to be a spiritual being does not preclude the possibility of also being a physical being. So all this quotation from uh, John 4 that God is a spirit is, is not enough. Uh, Mr. Spall, I said, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, if we look at the context of this discussion, the whole issue is a question of geography. The lady says to Jesus, our fathers worship God here in Mount Gerizim and the Jews worship God in Jerusalem. Now which is proper, which is appropriate, where is God? And that Jesus responds and says, the hour is coming now is where the true believer doesn't worship either in Jerusalem or Jerusalem, but God is a spirit. And I said, the whole point of that is that God cannot be restricted to one location. Why he's not restricted to one location is because he's a spirit. I said, so the whole point of Jesus' argument here in John 4 is to demonstrate that God is not limited by physical limits as we are. And Gerstner looked at me and he said, no, oh, no, 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 Mr. Sproul, that won't do. And he said, who else can answer this question? So for 50 minutes, Everybody in the class is, is, is struggling with Gerstner trying to answer the question. And we all fall at his feet, we lose. And we're ready to go out and sign up and be Mormons. <laughs> and so finally, you know, I raised my hand and said, Dr. Gerstner, we failed, and we failed miserably, and we acknowledge that. Now, will you please tell us what the right answer is to that question and how we should answer uh, a, a, in a debate like this. And he said, well, what you should do is go immediately to John chapter 4, <laughs> to the discussion 
with, between Jesus and the woman at Sychar. I said, Dr. Gerster, that's what I did. He said, yes. He said, and the man will come back and say that, you know, people are spirits too and they have bodies. And, and he said, then what you have to show is that in the context of Jesus' remarks, the only possible meaning that that text can be that God is only a spirit and does not have a body. I said, but that's what I said, Dr. Gerstner. He said, that's right. That's what you said. He said, and what did I, I, why, what did I say to you? And I said, you said to me, no, 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 no. That'll never do. And Dr. Gerstner looked at me and said, is that an argument? I said, no. <laughs> he said, but you let me get away with it. He said, all I said was, no, 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 no. That will never do. And went to somebody else, and you let me off the hook. He said, we could have had this thing all finished 55 minutes ago, Sproul, if you would have just stuck to your guns. But instead, he said, you surrendered without a peep of protest because I said, no, 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 no. How many times have I seen that uh, again? in my life to see how we do that. If people just keep talking, they think the argument continues when it was over a long time ago. But this, this whole point is clear to us in the Scriptures. Let me read uh, a little bit of that uh, text that I was just referring to in the discussion where the woman of Sychar said to, to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, the Scriptures clearly and plainly declare that God is a spirit, but our problem is, what is a spirit? We are as puzzled as Nicodemus was uh, one chapter earlier here when Jesus was talking to him about spiritual birth. And this theologian was scratching his head and said, you know, how can these things be? And Jesus talked to him. He said, it's like the wind. The wind blows where it will, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know from whither it comes or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. But how do we conceive of spirit? How did the Jews conceive it? Sometimes it seems as if the idea of spirit is like a gaseous type of matter, that a spirit sort of like a cloud or some kind of vapor that though it is, doesn't have the same kind of intensity of substance that a solid piece of material has, nevertheless, it is still a form of matter. But we have to understand that when the Bible speaks about God's being a spirit, what he is saying is that God is not matter. He's not gaseous matter. He's not liquid matter. He's not solid matter. He is not a composite being made up of several parts added together. And so the, this spirit being that the Scriptures speak of is something that transcends our ability to conceive of because we have no real reference point for spiritual being. We have an approximate analogy of spirit being in ourselves. Now let me see if I can illustrate this. I need somebody very, very bright here. I'm looking around the room. I need somebody that's, that I can depend on, uh, somebody that I can depend I can't waste a lot of time. I'm trying hard, desperately, to find somebody that I can, I can depend on. I'll try you, Mr. Fogarty. Uh, tell, tell everybody where you live, Bruce. Dallas, Texas. All right, and I'm going to ask you a few more questions here, and if you, uh, they'll, they'll be easy ones. You've heard his testimony, right? Lives in Dallas, Texas. Now, Mr. Fogarty, are you, at this moment, in Dallas, Texas? 
You're not. At this moment, Mr. Fogarty, are you alive? Correct. <laughs> I presume that means yes. Okay. All right. Now, I have one more question. If you tell us that you live in Dallas and you are currently not in Dallas, how come you're saying that you're alive? Only in that my typical point of domicile. <laughs> <laughs> Your typical point of domicile happens to be what? In Dallas. At Dallas. But you're not there now. Correct. So at the pre present moment, you are not living in Dallas. Correct. Right. Your home is in Dallas. Right. But you're not in Dallas. Right. Let me suggest to you that where you live is where you are. Does that make sense to you? Make perfect sense. Okay. Uh, but we talk like this as a manner of speaking. We talk about where our homes are, where our houses are. But actually, where you live is where you are. What the German existentialist called Dasein, that it's a being there. Because you cannot b exist outside, right now, at least in this life, outside of the confines of your physical body. You live inside your body. But are you your body? Are you your body? If your leg is amputated, amp amputated, Steve, amputated, it sounded like Richard Hostetler back. <laughs> if your leg is amputated, Steve, do you cease to be? No. Now, you've lost a part of yourself, you've lost a part of your body, the leg and so on, but you as a person continue to live, right? Where do you live specifically? Wherever, Wherever you are, and again, it's inside the body, but where does your life really unfold for you? Let me ask it another way. How important is your mind to your personality? Just, we've seen a tragedy in Major League Baseball just in this past week where the manager of the uh, Kansas City Royals was uh, diagnosed as having a malignant brain tumor, frontal section, frontal lobe of his brain. I don't know anything about that other than that they say that this is supposedly the seat of the emotion. And they describe some of the strange behavioral patterns that tipped off uh, his friends and family that something was wrong. Because his life changed as a direct result of this physical malady that affected his brain. Now, we live, and our, our whole bodies are involved in our life. But my consciousness of myself as a self takes place in my mind in my thoughts, in my feelings, in my motivations, in my drives. The body seems to be a, a mechanism that I, as a person, use to get about and to do certain actions and respond to certain things. But my consciousness of myself as a self is something that goes on in my mind, and the nature of the mind is one of the most elusive realities of all of human investigation. There is no philosopher and no scientist yet who has fully grasped the meaning of mind. There have been those who have tried to reduce mind to matter. That is to reduce the mind of a human being to the brain and to its impulses and uh, its mechanistic patterns. Do you remember B.F. Skinner's famous work, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, in which he talked about certain patterns of behavior that are determined by fixed mechanical causes, physical impulses and reactions, knee-jerk reactions. And there have been those in the 20th century who have tried to reduce thinking to matter. 
thereby destroying the very concept of personality as a myth. Now, what do you say to somebody who argues that concepts like freedom and dignity are mythological and unnecessary concepts because they are simply illusions? Because face it, if your thinking is the result of pure deterministic, mechanistic impulses of matter, you are not free. And if you are not free, you have no dignity. The only thing that's beyond freedom and dignity, ladies and gentlemen, are slavery and indignity. But here is Skinner arguing to the world that our thoughts are mere determined reactions. What's wrong with the argument? It's not an argument. It self-destructs. Because you say to Skinner, why should I listen to you? Are you trying to persuade me of something? Are you trying to give me an argument that's logical, cogent, that will make me change my mind? Why are you wasting my time when you know that all of my thinking is simply a result of physiological impulses and your argument is simply the result of a deterministic series of causes of physical impulses? There's no such thing as rationality. And there's no such thing as personality. But philosophers have understood we don't really know what the relationship is between thought and the brain, between mind and the body. But we know that we are conscious of ourselves as selves. And that's where we live, in our consciousness. And it's that dimension of man that defies reduction to pure material description. Now we ask the question, can that non-material dimension of human personality survive if something happens to the body? Some people say, no, once the brain dies, the mind goes with it. And without a brain, there can be no mind. And without a body, there can be no soul. The message of Christianity is this. Your body dies, you still live. That there is a continuity of personal consciousness and personal existence that goes beyond the grave. Do you realize how important that concept is to life itself? I know people get cynical and skeptical and they say, oh, this is the Christians are back there in a pie in the sky. Hey, pie in the sky? We're talking about life here. We're talking about people. We're talking about the reality of human personality. There's no more serious question for us ever to discuss than that. If a man dies, shall he live again? Because really what we're asking is, is there more to humanity than matter? Because we understand if there is not, then we don't matter. And that's unthinkable. Now, all I'm saying here is that we have an analogy that we as human beings are spiritual persons, but we're finite spirits who live in bodies. What the scriptures tell us about God is that he's an infinite spirit who is not bound by a body. Now there's a distinction that we need to make that I think is important that we understand. The difference between a spirit and a force. How many times have you heard people talk about God like this? Yes, I believe in God. I believe that God is some higher power. May the force be with you, okay? What kind of force do I want to have with me? Gravity? I mean, can you imagine being in a funeral home and turn around and being comforted by gravity? No, I, was, I spent a few days last week with a TENS unit. Do you know what that is? How many of you know what a TENS unit is? What do you call it? Uh, uh, 
trans vesta. What do you call it? Cutaneous or? No, I don't know. Transcutaneous electrical something or other. It's a little, little box with electricity. You electrocute yourself with it. If you have pain problems, chronic pain problems, you can get this electrical box and stick the electrodes and tape them to your back or to your neck or what's ever bothering you, and you turn up the juice. It's, you know, just you got to watch how far you turn up. <laughs> right? And you turn up that juice, and it sends impulse to your brains as sort of short circuits, is the theory, it sort of short circuits the normal pain message center. It's like jamming radio frequencies so that you can go through a day without pain. And it's a great unit for people who uh, have chronic pain. All right. Now, there, the force is with you. <laughs> and, and it's comforting to have that force jolting your back or jolting your neck. It's not comfortable when those doggone electrodes fall off your neck and your natural impulse is to do what? Grab them. Forgetting that the sensitivity in your finger is a little different than it is in your neck. And, ooh, you get a hot one by holding on to that thing. That's the force being with you. But the point of even with that TENS unit, I can't talk to it. I can't pray with it. I can't have a personal relationship of fellowship with a box of electrical current. Force, sheer force, is the power unleashed by something that is not sheer force. That in order for there to be force, something has to be producing that force. Now, if these two terms are synonymous in your mind, spirit and force, let's try to, uh, that would mean that they are interchangeable. And to say that there's a spiritual force out there would be saying nothing different than to saying there's a force force out there. Or that there's a power power out there. But when we talk about spiritual power or spiritual force, Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about personal power and personal force. You can have impersonal force, but you can't possibly have impersonal spirit. Because an impersonal spirit, by definition, is not a spirit. And what the Bible is saying to us here when it says that God is a spirit is that the Bible is saying that God relates to us as a person, that God is conscious, that God wills, that God generates activity. The only difference is He's infinite and His power and force and personality is purely spiritual without being closed in a body. Now, I mentioned in our last section that the great problem that we have with an infinite God is the same problem we have with God as a spirit. He's invisible. How do I relate to him? It's like the kid said he wants a God with skin on him. And that's what we have, of course, in the Incarnation where the Word becomes flesh. It's not that God stops being a spirit and stops being infinite and suddenly becomes finite and the eternal now becomes temporal, but rather the Almighty God of heaven and earth, the infinite, self-existent, eternal being, takes upon Himself the frame and the dust of a physical, biological person. He puts skin on so that Jesus can say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. The invisible becomes visible. Do you remember the story of Elisha in the Old Testament? Where how this king 
of the Syrians was planning strategy in secret against the Jewish king. And every time he would plot against the Jewish king and set an ambush, the Jewish king would escape. And so the king, the bad king, it gets all upset and he calls all his lieutenants together and he says, okay, where's the leak? Somebody is a traitor here and they're, because every time we say a plan, the Jewish king finds out. And, and his lieutenant said, hey, nobody's telling us it's that prophet, Elisha, over there. The things that we say in secret, he goes in and whispers to the Jewish king in his bedroom. And so they get the picture real fast. They said, if we're going to take care of the Jewish king, first we've got to do away with his prophet. So he sends this battalion or division or whatever it is, all these charioteers to this tiny little town of Dothan, this little village, where Elisha is all by himself there with, except for his servant. Servant gets up in the morning, goes and throws open the windows, and he looks out and he sees 50,000 chariots in the east. Then he runs over to the west and he opens up and he looks, and what does he see? Another 50,000 chariots. He looks to the north, 50,000 chariots. It's like, it's like the Lone Ranger and Tonto, you know? <laughs> what do you mean, we, white man, right? <laughs> and uh, he's panic stricken. He runs up and he shakes Elisha and he says, Elisha, wake up. He said, We're in big trouble. We're surrounded by these army guys. Elisha said, Take it easy. Relax. It's okay. Don't you understand that those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And Elisha's servant says, do you have a brain tumor? <laughs> he says, is there something wrong with you? He said, you don't understand. Look out there, this place is full of chariots and full of soldiers, and there's just you and there's just me. What do you mean those who are with us are greater than those who are against us? And then Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes. Lord, let him see beyond that dimensional barrier. Let him see what you've given me, the blessedness to observe. And behold, the servant's eyes were opened, and there round about Elisha were myriads and myriads of the heavenly host. Do you believe that? Do you know what it means to be a Christian is to believe what God says is real and is true. And what God says is that there is a transcendent, supernatural, spiritual reality that is far more significant than anything we will ever taste or touch with our hands. And that a Christian is one who lives his life on the conviction of the reality of the spiritual realm. Now we know, again by way of analogy, that right as we're talking, there may be in somebody's body in this room, I'd, I made a joke about a brain tumor, but brain tumors aren't funny. And there may be somebody in this room right now who has the nascent beginnings of a brain tumor developing in their head, and we don't know it. Somebody else may have an invisible to the naked eye invasion of a micro body that is going to bring to them a fatal disease. We know this, that if enough about, about the invisible world that's invisible to the naked eye, that if somebody sneezes right in front of us, we instinctively duck. Because we know that person who's sneezing is letting out into the air all kinds of germs. Can you see them? No. Can they kill us? Yes. And so we know that there are all kinds of invisible things that have a tremendous influence on our lives. And somehow we think that when we get to the limits that our microscopes and telescopes can perceive, that somehow we've gotten the full picture of reality. But there's no microscope that can penetrate the spiritual. There's no telescope that can look into the heart of God. There we are dependent upon God's self-revelation to speak to us from that spiritual realm 
and give us an assurance that He is there and that He is here with His heavenly host all around us, that there is spiritual communion and spiritual fellowship. Now, I don't have time to develop this, but let me just close with this. And what He wants is spiritual worship, a worship that is in spirit and in truth. That means a worship that comes out of the depth of our own personal being. Spiritual worship is not, uh, you, know, <coughs> how, you know, magic. Spiritual worship is worship that comes from the soul, from a heart that is inflamed with love for God. And it's a worship that is to be according to spirit and according to truth. We don't care about how we worship God. But God cares about how we worship God. And so what I want to look at in our next session is the truthfulness of God and God's commitment to truth.